The Anglican Church in Southern Africa has an estimated 3 million members in six sovereign nations and on two mid-Atlantic islands. The seat of the Archbishop, St. George's Cathedral, is in Cape Town, at the southwest corner of the continent. Our 28 dioceses include not only Johannesburg, at the center of Africa's biggest industrial and business hub, but also a growing number of mainly rural dioceses across the subcontinent. Apart from dioceses in South Africa, the province includes dioceses in Angola and Mozambique, in the kingdoms of Lesotho and Swaziland, in Namibia and on the island of St. Helena. Since 2008, the spiritual leader of this vast province has been the most reverend Tabo Mahoba, Archbishop of Cape Town. We often express our vision statement in the phrase, Anglicans act. By act, ACT, we mean that we seek to be anchored in the love of Christ revealed in Scripture, committed to God's mission with compassion and joy, and transformed by the Holy Spirit through discipleship and worship. In our vision statement, we add that across the diverse countries and cultures of our region, we seek to honor God in worship that feeds and empowers us for faithful witness and service, to embody and proclaim the message of God's redemptive hope and healing for people and creation, and to grow communities of faith that form, inform, and transform those who follow Christ. Two further themes run through all our life and work. Holistic mission rooted in a full commitment to evangelism, transformation of the legacies of apartheid. In our ministry, we are committed to eight provincial priorities. Liturgical renewal for transformative worship, theological education and formation, leadership development, health including HIV and AIDS, malaria and tuberculosis, the environment, women and gender, protection and nurture of children and young, public advocacy. I am blessed to share in the ministry of our province with dynamic and committed people who honor God, embody God's message of hope and healing, and transform communities to follow Jesus. I think you will understand what I mean as we watch this video together. Nossos irmãos, seminaristas, futuros líderes desta nossa igreja aqui em Amavila. So it's an honor to receive students from the seminary, the College of Transfiguration here today. We're here in Mozambique. This is our second year of, of doing uh, this exposure trips. We thought it is a good opportunity for the students to know the Diocese of Lebombo and also to meet the people here and see a little bit of our ministry. We're taking them to the rural, deep rural places like we have been here um, in, in Mozambique so that they understand the role of a priest and the role that the priest plays in the community. The priests in Mozambique, they're doing exactly what we are taught, that if you're a priest, you're like a community leader. So you're expected to be there, be visible, see, taste, touch, and do all the stuff. We've got our only full-time residential theological college in Gramstown. It's been there since around 1902, and so 
We've put a lot of our resources into that college. I put the resources at College of Transfiguration. So theological education gives you the spectacles and the framework. Whatever challenges that you're facing at this time, with the eyes of God and seeking the mind of Christ. So I still have the 21-year-olds and 22-year-olds fresh from high school, but I have people on their second career, those who are either teachers, nurses, whatever profession it is now, answering the call to come into theology education. And then they are able to make men that can sleep three to, to four persons. It is very liberating to see that people use whatever they have around them to make a difference in their own communities. We understand that uh, you cannot preach the gospel without getting involved into the real needs of the, of the people. I want to create this culture shock thing that life is not the way they think it is because where they come from and where they expose it. This is life in all forms and shapes and sizes and colors. But the church is not their home parish that they know. The church is vast, diverse, and it's exciting in its own local context. But my hope is that we create a breed of priests that are in it for the right reasons. That they realize that in poverty, there's still hope, there's still joy. We definitely need an education revolution in this country. And our ambition is uh, in the next 10 years, to plant at least two new schools in each of the 30 dioceses. The church has been involved in education since year one. You know, we've been in medicine, we've been in education, because that's an extension of the gospel. The Anglican Church School is a place where every child is recognized as God's child, as a beloved child of God. He's loved and it belongs. And secondly, that they are taught that life is a gift to them, a gift of God, and they need to live it with generosity and gratitude. Obviously we don't have exclusively Anglican teachers, not possible. But certainly in a community like Orange Farm, you'll find that Christian teachers from all sorts of backgrounds are attracted to working in this kind of a school. So our teaching philosophy is that every child deserves a wonderful education, a holistic education, not just the privileged children. And also politically in our country, I want to show it can be done. We're trying to develop, obviously, leaders, but good citizenship. And especially with our boys, this is called St. Joseph's Archbishop Mahoba School for Boys. I mean, I, it was just a humble gesture because of my passion for education. So the school was named after me. I'm proud. I really am very, very, very proud. I never thought I would be educated. I mean, I grew up in Alexander Township, uh, just outside Sentin, uh, a, a gang infested uh, area where going to school was quite an effort. I feel like God grabbed me by the scruff of my neck and said, I will beg you to walk through even those gangster infested areas to, to get to school. I'm grateful for that experience and I want to create an opportunity for every child to have that experience, to have an education, to have a key that could open all those possibilities. Well, this place is a beacon of hope, I would say. It's a male ward. We can take in 15 patients at a time. The female ward is almost just as big as this, compassionate ward with one bed. This house, maybe you were told, was very derelict and they were really raised from the ashes and turned it into an HIV AIDS centre. It's really the link between church and community. In rural areas, you would find that health facilities for poorer people are almost non-existent. Home-based caregivers, they don't just go out to care for people. They go to have conversations and to be in fellowship, and they bring the love of God to the home. We've got about 200 patients just in Austin, and then we do other areas in the vicinity. We go and do the wounds, we take care of them, we wash them, and I go around and visit all these patients on a weekly basis. 
I've got it from, I think, about 40 years. Well, it's, it's not so bad anymore because I've got a very nice sister looking after me. The church's biggest role is in prevention and also looking at advocacy. We look at how the church can be part of a, a solution that people have a general holistic wellness attitude about their lives. So it's about making sure that you're providing enough nutrition, but then also that people have, are in healthy relationships with each other and healthy relationships within the community. The diocese has prioritized gender as one of the critical issues to be dealt with. Swaziland basically is one of those patriarchal society where benefit is traced through the male line and therefore that creates inequality of some sort. Primary school level, there are more girls than there are boys. As they go to the higher level, girls tend to be left behind because we want to also establish the extent of gender-based violence within the church. The church speaks up quite a lot about civil conflict and just general violence, crime in society. It doesn't have, really have a good track record in speaking out against violence against women or domestic violence. <laughs> in everything that we do now, we try to have a balance of both men and women and also young people. And we don't believe that young people are the church of tomorrow. We believe that young people are the church of today and the church of tomorrow. We are seeing more and more in terms of leadership, women that are being ordained as priests. We were the first province in Africa to ordain a woman bishop in Swaziland. We've ordained Bishop Margaret in Falls Bay. For the first time since 1902, have appointed a woman to head our theological college. I think as a diocese, we should also be thinking around what was God's intention at creation? Because when he gave the dominion, he gave everyone dominion. It wasn't about the man. Oh, drought. If you talk of drought, you talk of death. It has been a long time since we have been having this drought. Drought has been extensive in Swaziland, especially in the rural areas. The impact has been huge. Last year, the country lost a lot of livestock. And we know that in Swazi culture, cattle is wealth. So when a person has got cattle, then that person is considered to be a wealthy person. It really affects the school when it comes to their children's performance. They don't perform well because they come to school hungry. The drought is as a result of environmental impact and at the same time the drought is also impacting on the environment. The environment is very dear to my heart. Soil, uh, the water and the air is because it is care of the human being and care of the environment. It is not about just prosperity, but it's also about salvation. You want to create people that are going to be stewards of the environment. So the church has indeed been a, a, a great help whereby we're training preschool teachers on how to impact environmental knowledge to their learners because uh, we are of the vision that if we catch them young, they will grow up to be responsible citizens that are conscious about the environment. Here we are at Latikulu uh, Parish. The money for this garden was donated by us by a member of the um, Brickin 
diocese in uh, Scotland, Dundee. But the drought has also caught up with us here in Tlatikulu. But we still believe that it will work because um, we're hoping this year there's going to be enough rain and um, people can do this gardening as far as the water can take them. I think within the priority of public advocacy, we're taking seriously the injunction that we can't just be hearers of the word, but we have to be doers of the word. Including struggle icon Desmond Tutu. Members of various religious groups calling for the protection of Chapter 9 institutions. We have arranged several marches against corruption in the country, and all those things are rooted in our gospel values, an imperative that we need to speak for those that cannot speak. But the critical thing is, we don't want to set ourselves as holier than thou. We want to be a caring church, a questioning church, a reflective church, and a, a listening church. What is sustainability? What is stewardship? Leadership development will need to look at ensuring that every Anglican member know their identity before Christ and to wear that lens in addressing every personal and societal problem. And we have people from South Africa, from the neighboring countries of Africa, and they bring those cultures into it somehow. So it is a multilingual service and a multilingual community. Yes. We're wanting to give an opportunity for all our parishioners want to enjoy liturgy as an opportunity to say thank you God for the identity you've given us as this particular church. Thank you God for our lives. Thank you God that we are here at this present time. Our prayer book doesn't have much that locates it on these shores and in this context. And so our bishops were the first ones to say we should embark on this process to develop a prayer book for Africa, an African prayer book. You'll see nine prayer books. They are identical in their structure. And we always say, you know, you worship in the language of your choice, but it might be a good thing to worship also in the language of the person sitting next to you. It's just beautiful and a privilege to be an Archbishop to see all forms of different liturgical expression in our province. As it was in the time of the struggle, I hope the church can embody the future that is still very, very timidly breaking in amongst us. Anglicans have a long history in Southern Africa and as you have seen in the video, we are committed to transforming our worship and ministry so that it reflects our current context without abandoning our core beliefs. We say in our part of the communion that we find our humanity through the humanity of others. In that spirit, I invite you in the words of Jesus to Andrew in the Gospel according to John to come and see. Moreover, I invite you to join us in partnership with the assurance that working together, we will, again quoting John, see greater things than these. Thank you and may God bless you and be with us as we move forward together.